Johannesburg is the commercial center of South Africa. Since gold was first discovered here, everything has revolved around money. The city was founded on the desire for easy money, a desire that still exists today. Although gold mining no longer takes place in South Africa's largest metropolis, evidence of it still remains. Johannesburg was built on gold. The view across the city is known as the rooftop of Africa. From the 50th floor of Africa's tallest building, the Carlton Towers, there's an all-encompassing view of the city's narrow streets, a jungle of concrete and glass. The African Museum is a contemporary building, one of South Africa's most exquisite landmarks. It contains a large variety of geological exhibits and detailed accounts of the city's past surface mining that gave rise to the massive gold rush. The resistance to apartheid is also illustrated, as well as the history of Africa's native inhabitants who journeyed from present-day Botswana to the south of the country. Passing the city's surface mining areas that are still visible today, the road leads to Gold Reef City. This large historical theme park features the Johannesburg of pioneering times. On display are old mining wagons that transported the ore from within the mines. And there's also a chance to see the liquid gold as it's turned into bullion. and processed as gold coins. Of course, singing and dancing is part of the fun. Africa's largest zoo is owned by the state and contains a large number of exotic animals that are comfortably housed in spacious enclosures. There are giraffes, the rare South American Maine wolf, lions and around 200 varieties of birds that are cared for to the highest of standards. On our journey north, we stop at the cultural center of Lesedi. In a cultural experiment, families from all over Africa have settled here. Together, they display their costumes and traditions. On a large stretch of land are the huts and kraals of various tribes, all of which are inhabited. Colourful painted stones lead the way to the different tribes. Here the visitor can observe tribal life, how food is prepared and many other activities that are part of the daily routine.
The people here are open and friendly to visitors and invite them to take part in their daily and cultural life. The highlight of the visit to Lesedi is a lively dance performed by all the villagers in a large communal hut. Rhythm flows in their blood. Old and young, men and women, all are keen to demonstrate their traditional rituals. An entertaining and impressive display. In contrast to Johannesburg, Pretoria grew at a calmer pace and has developed from a Boer farming municipality into South Africa's administrative capital. Located on a hill is the Four Trekker Monument that is a reminder of the Boer's great trek and in 1830 the crucial battle in which they defeated the Zulus. The wall that encircles the hill is decorated with ox carts that were used by the Boers as their traditional method of defence. The stone bust of Andres Pretorius points solemnly towards Pretoria. Surrounded by the parliament and courthouse, at the centre of this city of colourful parks and gardens is Church Square. The huge stone statue of the Boer's first president, Paul Kruger, looks down onto his people. The peace treaty that ended the Boer War was signed in Melrose House. Built from red sandstone on a hill above the city, the semicircular neoclassical Union buildings were constructed in 1913 as the presidential residence. Although the presidential and ministerial offices are not open to the public, it's worth a visit, if only for the glorious views across Pretoria. The road leads northwest into the desolate landscape of the barren African savanna. And suddenly, a fantastic wonder world appears. Sun City, a magnificent fantasy world full of African ambience. In animal world, playful lion cubs can be observed at close quarters. Nearby, the Birdman performs artistic tricks with a mixed variety of birds. In Quena Gardens, there's a crocodile breeding station. At feeding times, both small and large crocodiles can be watched as they snap up their food. On Waterworld's artificial lake, Bemused water birds keep a watchful eye on the scooter riders.
Next to the Sun City Hotel is the casino that made Sol Kersner the richest man in South Africa. The futuristic Cascades Hotel derived its name from its wonderful setting of waterfalls, pools and lush plant life. It's hardly surprising that two million visitors come here each year. The numerous African-themed rooms of the entertainment center provide a host of fun and games around the clock. The Jungle Casino is also open day and night for both winners and losers. From here, there's an impressive view of the lost city for which the sole means of access is the Bridge of Time that is guarded by massive stone elephants. Next, the Valley of Waves, with water spouting lions, water slides, climbs, and a beachside wave pool. It's a lot of fun. Here, there's a real love affair with water. On our journey into the heart of this lavish African leisure park, there's a Roman amphitheater with adjoining water pool and Roman columns. Now there are tropical waterfalls, an atmospheric jungle scenery, and the severe humidity turns the climb into a challenging, perspiring adventure. Finally, we reach the highlight of this extraordinary fantasy world amid the African savanna. The Lost City. This gigantic African palace first opened its doors to the public in 1992 with 350 deluxe rooms and suites. The dimensions and furnishings of this fairy tale world are breathtaking. With their African animal motifs, the wall and ceiling mosaics impress all who see them, and the atrium extends for six floors. This palace has the reputation of being one of the world's finest and most exquisite hotels. Luxury par excellence. A multi-million dollar investment, numerous domes and towers decorate the lost city's lavish building complex. The outstanding view from above the palace's imaginatively designed bathing areas is testament to the fact that no less than two million palms, bushes and trees have been specially planted here. The golf course is the annual setting for a million dollar golf tournament that attracts visitors from all over the world. In these unique surroundings, golf takes on a new dimension. Sun City, one of the world's most unusual and luxurious resorts. The route travels northeast over the misty, and one time heavily defended Drakens Mountains in the direction of the Kruger Park that extends along the border with Mozambique.
everywhere, villagers expertly carve wooden souvenirs, while women eagerly offer them for sale. The historic village of Pilgrim's Rest is a reminder of the gold rush, as it was here in 1873 that the gold prospector, William Trafford, discovered the precious yellow mineral. Today, this settlement is still a lively place due to its hundreds of inhabitants who take great pride in their heritage, a living museum visited by a constant stream of tourists. In earlier days, South Africa's first large gold mining city appeared almost overnight with 18 drinking bars, the Royal Hotel, various stores, three bakeries, and two banks. Located on the hill beyond the village is the old gold diggers cemetery. After a short drive we reach one of Africa's great natural wonders, the Blyde River Canyon. Mist emerges from a huge landmass, a massive and majestic red sandstone canyon with almost sheer slopes. Water spills over huge stone plateaus and plunges into the 20 kilometer long canyon, carrying sand and pebbles in its wake. Thus for thousands of years, deep and narrow canyons have been created in the reddish yellow dolomite rock with its smooth, steep walls and fascinating circular holes. From high up on a small bridge, there's a dizzy view directly into the whirlholes deep down below the walls of the canyon. Each day, many tourists arrive by air in Kruger Park one of the oldest and most famous animal reserves in the world, covering an area of more than 20,000 square kilometers. We enter the nature park through the Orpen Gate that derived its name from the family that donated large areas of its farmland to the Kruger Park. In 1898, a small area between Sabi and Crocodile River was designated as a National Wildlife Reserve. Excitement grows as the first animals appear. Standing in the middle of the road, two rhinoceroses are looking out for tourists. It pays to keep a safe distance.
The first white people came to this area in 1725. 31 Dutchmen who were attempting to create a trading route to Zimbabwe. Due to the relentless work of the park's gamekeepers, several animal species have been saved from extinction. Important work that protects the balance of nature. The hippopotamus overcomes the heat of the day by bathing in water and it can completely submerge itself for several minutes, a sight that is often very amusing when several of them do it. Amid the jungle landscape, there are constant fascinating views of a glittering river. A jeep takes us to one of the park's most beautiful observation points. A lonely male elephant plods solemnly through his territory while blowing sand onto his back to fend off irritating flies. From the edge of a steep slope, there is an overwhelming view across the amazing and endless landscape of the African bush. In addition to its many varieties of animals, the Kruger Park has an abundance of plants and trees, such as the monkey bread tree, the juice of which is well favoured by baboons. In the Maine's Kukuza camp, visitors are welcomed by the three founders of the National Park, Paul Kruger, James Stevenson Hamilton, and Pete Grobler. To protect both nature and animals, the park's knowledgeable gamekeepers sometimes travel across the bush by bicycle. Savannah, bushland, and a unique assortment of animals. The images of this national park stay in the memory forever. Once the home of the big game hunter. Today, a sanctuary for nature. The journey continues by plane from the Kruger Park across Swaziland and KwaZulu-Natal to the Indian Ocean's south coast, to Port Elizabeth. South Africa's fifth largest city has the reputation of being both hospitable and windy. Though it isn't any more windy here than it is in any of the country's other coastal cities. In front of the public library, in the old center of the city, there is a monument of Queen Elizabeth, In the 19th century, 4,000 British settlers arrived here at the Wild Coast and fought for possession of the territory against its native inhabitants. But this is history.
Today, everyone lives peacefully and tourism has become the city's main industry. At the foot of the hill, Fort Frederick once served as a symbol of British power. Today, only its ruins remain. A large number of cannon defended the harbour and deterred any unwelcome visitors. The British settlers protected their port with all means at their disposal. Titsikama is the first stop on the garden route that leads along the coast from Port Elizabeth to Mossel Bay. Several lodges offer overnight accommodation and provide a high degree of comfort for those travelling through the African bush. Here, where nature is at its most abundant and spectacular, it's just as it appears in the holiday brochures. In front of the entrance to this coastal national park, there is a wide canyon in which for thousands of years, the Storms River has carved itself into the soft sandstone. Finally, the entrance to the strictly controlled park appears. The first view of the Indian Ocean's rocky coast is breathtaking. 80 kilometers of sheltered beaches and a well-protected coastline. A huge chain bridge crosses the mouth of a wide inlet. Motorboats transport adventurous tourists deep into the canyon. Soon our exploration of this fascinating coastline is over and we are already following the path that leads us back to our starting point. Now it's time to enjoy an invigorating swim in the shallow bay or clamber over the rocks. Take a stroll on narrow paths through flowering meadows along the rocky coast with its enormous waves. The garden route continues, passing fertile meadows and ponds to Neisner. The peaks of two gigantic sandstone cliffs protect the entrance to the 18 square kilometer Neisner Lagoon, a highlight of the garden route. Situated on the slopes of this charming landscape, there are beautiful houses 
with a splendid view of the lagoon. Even today, there is a nostalgic journey by steam train from Neisner to George, a superb tourist attraction. The Neisner Lagoon is a paradise for many kinds of animals and birds. Migrating birds rest and feed here before continuing on their long and tiring journey. All types of boats are permitted, but at low tide it's easy to become stuck in the mud. Because of its wonderful seaside location, this area is popular with foreign tourists and also with South African holidaymakers. The peninsula is a remarkable natural paradise. Water from the ocean flows into the bay twice a day and is also supplied with fresh water from the Otanika Mountains. We cross the peninsula on a ferry boat, then continue uphill by train. The meandering view is quite incredible. The road goes higher and higher into undisturbed nature. The return journey along the rocky bay is also fascinating. The cliffs of the romantic coastline are open to the forces of wind and rain. The boat takes us further along the coast and then we return to the harbour in Neisner where numerous boats calmly lie at anchor in the evening sun. Wilderness is the next stop with lagoons, a nature park and tourist attractions. One of the most famous sites is the railway bridge that crosses a coastal inlet in a long curve. On this 28 kilometer long section of the coast, Endless sand dunes reach to the water and the loud roar of the waves seems to go on forever. On the coast we travel through Otanika Mountains and along the plateau of the Karoo system to Oatshorn. We visit the Kango Caves, a vast labyrinth of caves that contain a large amount of multicolored and strangely shaped stalactites and stalagmites. The raw beauty of this unusual landscape has a special charm. The beautiful and historical mountain road leads us up into the highlands. A 
Alongside the road, there's a collection of amusement parks that feature camel rides and a whole variety of entertainment. Although little rain falls here, the survival of its abundant vegetation is reliant on several mountain rivers that nourish it with water. Finally, we reach the first large ostrich farms, for which the highlands are renowned. The huge, flightless birds are thought to be especially at home here. An ostrich can live for 40 years and every nine months produces a kilo of feathers. One egg has the nutrients of 24 hen's eggs. Their skin has many uses and their meat is considered a delicacy. The city of Oatshorn appears to be deserted, but the huge ostrich egg in front of the city hall makes it clear that the wealth and fame of this city is due to the ostrich. On an ostrich farm, there's a comical race and visitors are given a detailed explanation about the breeding of these intriguing creatures. The journey continues. The drive through the impressive mountain landscape leads us back down to the coast, to the romantic garden route. Mossel Bay has an old natural harbour and well-ordered residential districts. The Portuguese Bartolomeu Dias was the first European to land here when he replenished his ship's barrels with fresh water. Sailors posted their mail here for collection by the next ships to arrive in the bay. They placed their letters in the trunk of a large and historic milkwood tree that is still known as the old post office tree mansion. The calm Asia Blue Bay has developed into a popular tourist resort. The land is covered by pasture. Herds of cows and sheep graze peacefully. Now we leave the coast for the last time and drive across the Western Cape through a desolate landscape scattered with lakes. And yet another mountain range before we can enter South Africa's fertile wine growing region. Along the wine route, Paal is the largest producer of wine. It was founded in 1720 and named after a granite rock that hangs like a huge pearl above the city. This monument of the Afrikaans language towers high on a hill close to the city. This is where the world famous South African vine grows and where both branch and grape are carefully nurtured. It's the location of the largest wine cooperative in the world.
The small wine town of Franschuk was founded in 1688 on land that once belonged to Huguenot immigrants. Its French origin is indicated by wonderfully restored historic buildings and a unique ambience. Driving through endless wine plantations and green mountains, the scenery is reminiscent of parts of Europe. It bears an uncanny resemblance. Cape Town, our final destination. The metropolis on the southern edge of Africa is certainly one of the world's most beautiful cities. An exciting combination of Africa, Europe and the Caribbean. A cable car ascends Table Mountain with a wonderful view of the sheltered bay. The Klipschliefer has adapted itself perfectly to life on this plateau that is 1,000 meters above sea level. Through Bokart, colorful houses line the street down to the city, in the center of which the impressive Houses of Parliament surround Company's Garden. The former Dutch settler's kitchen garden is located close to the house of the state president. The St. George Cathedral was built a century ago in Neo-Gothic style. Originally, the Dutch didn't intend to settle here and solely used the bay to distribute supplies to their ships. Built in 1697, the pentagon-shaped citadel is the oldest stone building in South Africa. It was built to protect the first Dutch settlers. Fortunately, it never saw battle. On the southwestern side of the large city park is the country's oldest museum, the South African Museum that contains a treasure trove of African culture. And also huge whale skeletons, practical explanations on evolution, and a section that features the creatures of the deep. Part of the historic harbour is the Victoria and Albert waterfront. Its splendour is only surpassed by the harbours of San Francisco and Sydney. The large water tanks of the two ocean aquarium in the harbour area contain around 3,000 examples of sea life from the Indian and Atlantic Oceans.
In the adjoining South African Maritime Museum, there are examples of the city's historic ships, its fishing industry, and details on the construction of its outstanding harbour. Since January 1997, ferry boats have travelled to Robben Island, 11 kilometres off the coast. In earlier times, it was an infamous prison, but today it's a museum. On arrival, and even prior to entering the main building, there are instructions and explanations. Frightening reminders of the recent past are still evident as Robben Island was once used as a high security prison for the opponents of apartheid. Former guards and some of the ex-prisoners who were imprisoned at the same time as world famous South African President Nelson Mandela act as guides. Following the so-called Rivonia trial, Nelson Mandela and seven other ANC members were sentenced to life imprisonment on Robben Island. The spiritual head of the South African anti-apartheid movement served 18 long years of imprisonment on the island before he eventually experienced freedom. Thus, this former place of misery and racism has become a symbol of peaceful resistance, as well as a tourist trap. After a 30-minute journey by ferry boat, we return to Cape Town's harbour and its picturesque location at the foot of Table Mountain. Along the rocky coastline, a road leads from the city to the southernmost tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. Covering an area of 8,000 hectares and a coastline of 40 kilometers, since 1936, this section of the Cape Peninsula has been a nature reserve. This is the home of many animals and plants threatened by extinction, and its rugged landscape attracts nearly a million visitors each year. Bartolomeo Diaz first sailed around this rock in 1488, the Cape of Storms. Here the seabed is covered with shipwrecks. As Sir Francis Drake sailed past the Cape for the first time, he exclaimed, this is the most beautiful peninsula that I have seen on my travels around the world. Naturally, the extreme tip of the Cape is the most popular camera shot for many tourists. The drive on the spectacular mountain road around the Cape is an amazing adventure for all those lucky enough to experience it. The magnificent end of the world. One of the many natural wonders of this unique land that unites 
European influence with African pride. A country of extremes, paradoxical, exotic, wild and breathtakingly beautiful. The entire world in one country, South Africa. <laughs>